I'm Christy Hummel and I have been living in Vermont for about five years. I'm the middle of three girls um, and we're close in age. So growing up, I would see their reactions, their behaviors, their activities, um, how they express their emotions. And I felt very different and I bottled a lot of it up inside. Um, and so I think, you know, I have an incredibly supportive family, um, yet for some reason there was this innate almost shame over the fact that I was feeling differently. Um, and I think my family wanted to encourage me and help me. And sometimes the messages of, you know, don't be so sensitive about that, or, you know, this is, this, ex this reaction is too extreme for the situation, um, in a way ended up being really invalidating. So my family, you know, none of us knew what was going on. Um, and then having a kid who was a little more quiet um, and sensitive, I think there may have been some signs, but I don't think they were enough that my parents were aware. You know, I didn't often share much. I, I kept a lot in. Well, there was one time where I had a plastic knife from McDonald's and I was at the table and I was carving a happy face into my hand. And my dad saw and, and was like, what are you doing? And he flicked it out of my hand. But we never talked about it. Nothing ever happened. I think what it was was I want to be happy because it was a happy face. And I do think it was sub subconscious because I was hiding so much of the cutting and being so secretive about it um, that that initial, because I think I was pretty young. I, I wish I, I should have asked my dad. I remember throwing myself off the monkey bars on purpose. I remember banging my head in a closet. I remember doing a lot of like wrist banging and stuff, being little like that. And there was something about <clears throat> the physical pain was a break. Focusing on the physical pain and feeling it was a break from this constant mental stuff that was going on in there that was exhausting and scary and hard. Um, and so it was like this minor break, you know, and they actually say, I've read that endorphins are released, believe it or not. Um, and then there was something about watching it heal, being able to take care of it. There was something about it being private and secret, but, um, you know, it was an unhealthy coping skill that kind of started by accident, just l searching for relief. Yeah. Sometime in high school, um, my older sister found this suicide kit under my bed with like a letter and exacto knives and, and pills and I was in high school but that disconnected feeling and stuff I think started really young um and I think um I used to pray that I would not wake up at night um I when I was younger we started going to church um we weren't super religious but um I think prayer, that that prayer of, please, God, I don't want to wake up in the morning. Um, I hate my life. I'm so miserable. This sucks. What's wrong with me? Um, I'm such a bad person. I had this weird, innate belief that I was a bad person. I was being punished somehow. Um, and so um, I would pray not to wake up. So everything shifted for my whole family. All of a sudden, the focus was on Christy. Christy is doing this behavior, this harming behavior, and wants to kill herself and is miserable. So we have to support her. And we got in this kind of... So my family, we're fixers. We, we like to find solutions and fix things. And I think that's a great quality. Um, in, in my case, however, it kind of backfired on us because I internalized it as I'm broken and I have to be fixed and something's wrong with me. Um, and every medication and therapy that we tried that kept failing or not working for me or um, became a personal failure, felt like a personal failure. It was like a light switch when, when, it, when it went off and I decided that I was going to you know, end my life. Um, I had been really struggling with alcohol. I had started to self-medicate with alcohol and I kind of felt like I would never fix my mental health. I would always be an alcoholic. I could never, you know, be in recovery for that. And, um, that this was, I'm better off. It's better off for everybody, um, to just knock it off and just end it now. <clears throat> and so when I woke up at Dartmouth Hitchcock in the hospital, um, 
I, I remember being really angry. <laughs> I remember the initial feeling of, I can't even kill myself the right way. What is wrong with me? And now I have to deal with this. And the look on my parents' face when they drove, you know, the four hours, um, not knowing if I was okay. Um, when they saw me, that look of um, sadness um, and fear um, is etched into my soul. Like, I remember that look on their faces of just, oh my God, our poor kid, like, what do we do? Um, my face had been all beaten up and, and, and I was, um, just a mess. And, um, that anger kind of subsided. And I said to my parents, I think almost verbatim, what I'm doing isn't working and I need way more help than you know. And things have been way worse than you think. Even though I'm a, you know, a 30 year old woman, there's a lot of stuff going on and I look like I'm functioning, but I'm not. And, um, I need more help. And, uh, I'm really grateful that they were able to do that. I realized that this is something I'm going to have to roll with. It's not going away. You know, Prozac and therapy isn't going to magically make this disappear. Um, I have to figure out how to set up my life and live better and figure out how to deal with this crap because hiding behind alcohol and cutting and stuff like that is ruining my life. And there's got to be some hope or something out there. And I, I just have to find my purpose. And right now my purpose is just to stay alive. It's been two years, three years since my, actually three years, June 19th. Um, since my attempt, my last suicide attempt. Um, <clears throat> and so it's taken three years of rebuilding. A big thing for me is isolation can be really dangerous for me. Uh, and when I'm kind of uh, having a string of bad days with my mental health, uh, my family will notice that I'm quiet in the family chat or my friends from my 12 step program may notice that they haven't heard from me in a while. Um, so having a, a network of people, um, is really helpful. Um, and then <clears throat> being really honest, like rigorous honesty, um, is really important because for so long I was sneaky and hiding and ashamed, but I have, I have to, that second suicide attempt, I said to every doctor, anyone that would listen, I'm still suicidal. I will jump off a building if you let me out of here. And I'm not a threat. I'm just telling you how it is. Um, and I, I just, I had to be honest about my addiction issues. I had to be honest about <clears throat> all the things I had been hiding. Um, and, uh, so to me now, um, I would much rather just lay it on the table for someone, um, or, you know, tell them the degree to which I'm struggling and the help, the kind of help that I need. What do you say to someone who's cutting themselves, who's hurting themselves, um, wondering, well, how badly are they doing it? Are they going to kill themselves? Are they crazy? How do I help them? I wish or I hope that um, people know um, there's no shame in feeling suicidal. Um, and for your family and friends, like, you can't fix it. You didn't cause it. It's no one's fault. I just really hope that, that people... Uh, um, share their stories and talk about it um, because it stops it. it. It lessens our emotional response. You know, the more something becomes normalized, the less our emotional response can be. So that shame that, you know, people not being educated um, or not understanding, if, if we keep talking about it, then maybe people will be able to help more, understand more, um, or get their own help if they need it. Um, so that stigma, that shame um, may go away if we keep sharing. Vermont actually has a lot of help for this and that um, for suicide, for people who are dealing with mental health challenges. Um, and I would ask people, you know, in the community to be compassionate um, and, and open-minded, maybe less judgmental. I would encourage people to ask questions and to educate themselves. If you 
think or suspect or wonder that someone is struggling or suicidal. Ask them directly, are you thinking about suicide because I love you? It's as simple as that.